Okay, so uh, so I looked at the syllabus. I looked at uh, what we have covered so far. It seems to me that the syllabus will be over after today's class, and so we won't have any class on Monday and on Wednesday. And looking at the classroom, I feel that's the right <laughs> right thing to do at this point of time because uh, the attendance is dropping. Uh, by the way, just for your knowledge, there are 45 students registered in this class. <laughs> I don't see those many of them in this classroom today. So uh, we have been talking about approximate dynamic programming. Um, we have, there are four basic uh, approximate dynamic programming methods. Uh, you can of course mix and match. You can have a lot of different uh, mix and matching phenomena in order to come up with an approximate dynamic programming for the problem that you may be interested in. So the first one is model approximation. And this is the topic for today's discussion. We are going to discuss about model approximation today. The second one was approximation in value function space. And the third one was approximation in policy function space. And we talked about various types of function approximating classes that you could use either to approximate the value function or the policy function uh, in, in your approximate dynamic programming algorithm. So there's nothing much to discuss in these two situations. Just approximate and you should be fine. And then fourth one was approximation for long horizon. So we talked about essentially three algorithms here. When you have a very long horizon, how do you approximate? So one is if your terminal cost is small in comparison to running cost, you just pick a small uh, uh, capital N, small horizon length, and you let the terminal cost be zero for that small horizon problem. And that's an approximation for long horizon problem. Now, on the other side, if your terminal cost is very important in comparison to the running cost, then you cannot take the terminal cost to be zero because the solution will be pretty absurd uh, for a small time horizon optimization problem. So what you want to do is you want to come up with a good heuristic which will allow you to compute or at least estimate the terminal cost for the small horizon problem. So that is known as rollout algorithm. And we talked about rollout algorithm in the previous class. And the third class of algorithms where when you want your state to be small, you want your state to be close to 0. And what you do is instead of thinking about what the terminal cost should be for the small horizon problem, you just put a constraint that you want your terminal state to be zero. Okay, so you add a constraint in your original problem, in your small horizon problem, and that allows you to, that leads to what is known as model predictive control algorithm, and, uh, and that's a valid approximate dynamic programming method for solving long horizon problems. Uh, model predictive control is actually pretty uh, widely used uh, I, I don't know how widely it is used in industry, but at least in academic papers, model predictive control has been used quite a lot across a wide range of uh, wide range of applications. So, rollout algorithm not that much, although the whole field of reinforcement learning is based on this idea of rollout algorithm. So, I guess uh, rollout algorithm is also heavily used in academic literature, and then the uh, limited look ahead with zero terminal cost, uh, that's also pretty heavily used in many applications. So, so I guess the, the three algorithms that we studied, you can view them as sort of fundamental ideas for approximate dynamic programming for long horizon problems. And almost every problem that you would encounter on day to day basis would be a long horizon problem because your embedded system, if your horizon is 20 time steps, or 24 time steps, your embedded system would be small enough 
uh, would be small so that you cannot run a 24 time step optimization problem and you, you're restricted to running only two or three time step optimization problem. So in those situations, again, you have to resort to one of the three algorithms we discussed in the previous class uh, in order to deal with the long horizon problem. So anyways, we have done this. We have done this uh, 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 in the two classes ago. We have done this in the previous class. And this is the purpose for this class, model approximation. So let me write down what the optimization problem is. I have xt plus 1 equals to, and I want to minimize over gamma t that maps xt to ut. ct plus 1, xt plus 1, plus summation t equals 0 to capital T, ct, xt, ut. And I have a couple of constraints, gt, xt, ut less than equal to 0, and ht, xt, ut equals to 0. Okay, so this is the problem that I want to solve. Uh, the simplest model approximation that we all know of, just linearize around the equilibrium point or equilibrium trajectory, and you get a linear system with uh, some sort of cost and some sort of constraint. Okay, so linearization is a, is a simple model approximation. <coughs> And as you can imagine, you can do linearization of the state transition function, you can do linearization of the constraints, and all of those are valid approximation. And the way you do linearization, you have this f of xt ut. You can apply the same idea to gt and ht and cost functions and all. Uh, so you say gradient of x. Evaluated at x bar t, u bar t, times x minus x bar t. So x bar t and u bar t are nominal trajectory, plus gradient of u, f t, transpose, transpose, u t minus u bar t plus some small terms. So this is the usual Taylor series approximation for functions of multiple variables. Oh, uh, I guess I should add f t of x bar t u bar t on the on the on the right side of this equation. So this is the first term of the Taylor series. This is the second term of the Taylor series, and then you can have higher order terms in the Taylor series. Okay, so as long as you are following this x bar t, u bar t trajectory very closely, you can do this linearization approximation of the state transition function. You can do the same thing for gt, you can do the same thing for ht, and that's a model approximation for your original problem. Those of you who may have taken feedback control systems, you may have seen this earlier, because in feedback control system, we talk about how do you approximate a nonlinear model with a linear model. So it's very similar to that idea. OK, so we do linearization using Taylor approximation. Now let's think about, oh, any question on this linearization idea? No? OK. Now let's uh, think about the following optimization problem. Uh, 
So you are a t-shirt seller, you have a t-shirt shop close to high street, and you have only three types of t-shirts, small, medium, and large, that's it. Those are the three sizes, and you are selling those t-shirts to college students. And you have a very small shop, and you can keep only 100 t-shirts of each size, okay? So what are the different states that you would have? So states would be what your inventory level is at this point of time or at the end of the day. So let's say each day is one time period and you, you get certain number of t-shirts. So you order certain number of t-shirts and certain number of t-shirts get sold. And then at the end of the day, you have certain inventory level XT. And so if you think about your XT, uh, it basically has three components, X1T, X2T, X3T. So small, medium, large, the number of small t-shirts, sm number of medium t-shirts, and number of large t-shirts. And it lies in this set. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way up to 100 raised to 3. So you can have any point in this particular set. What's the size of this set? What's the size of the state space? This is your state space. And if you look at the size of the state space, it's 100 raised to 3, which is 10 raised to 6. So your state space is actually a million. It has a, the size of a million. OK? So it's a very large state space. And if you have to run dynamic programming, it's going to take a lot of time for you to run the dynamic program over, let's say, a one-month period where capital T is 30 or 31. So over a one-month period, this dynamic programming equation is going to take a lot of effort because your state space is actually pretty large. Actually, your action space is also pretty large. You, you have to figure out how many t-shirts you want to order. Should it be 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on? So your UT is also going to be pretty large. What do you, how, do, how would you reduce the size of the state space? How would you do a, a model approximation in this particular situation? What do you think? So think about it from a t-shirt seller perspective. What would you do to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis about how many t-shirts you should be ordering for the next day? You can always look at your inventory, and your inventory could have anywhere between zero t-shirts all the way to 100 t-shirts. And 100 is the maximum you can go. You can't go beyond that. Yes? Uh, maybe you could just focus on the t-shirts that are most in demand, or just pretend that you have 300 shirts and the size doesn't matter. <coughs> okay. So you are going to lump all the sizes into one size. You know, you have t-shirts. So you, you're not going to have three dimensions. You're just going to have one dimension. Um, and then in that case, your state space becomes 0 to 300. I guess that's a good idea. Uh, although I'm not saying, well, okay. It may not be a good idea, but it's certainly one possible way of reducing the state space. So he's going to collapse all these three things, and he's going to consider a new state, which is x tilde t, which is one transpose xt. And this would lie in 0 to 300. It's certainly a reduction from 1 million, by the way. Okay, But he's going to collapse. He's not going to keep track of sizes. He's just going to collapse everything into how many t-shirts he has. And then the size of the state space has reduced significantly. Um, but that's a, a, probably a good idea that could work. Any other thoughts you may have? Reduce it based on sales every day. So if you are selling less. You can't have your state space dependent on the actions at this point of time. 
that would change the whole setting completely. Yeah. Could you break it into three separate problems, each with a 100 dimensional state space? OK. Uh, I like that idea very much. So he's saying, OK, why should I consider one big optimization problem for all three states? Why shouldn't I just solve or come up with three separate optimization problems uh, for small, small, medium, and large uh, uh, t-shirt. So in which case, each state space has only 100 possibilities. And so you are solving three dynamic programs instead of one dynamic program. Again, an excellent idea, and an idea that is widely used in, uh, in uh, vehicles. Because you have too many states, so you just look at one subsystem and optimize that subsystem, and you forget about the rest of the subsystems inside the car. So if you're looking at uh, thermal management of the vehicle, you will only optimize thermal management of the vehicle. And then somebody else is looking at the emissions of the vehicle, and they will only optimize emissions of the vehicle, and so on and so forth. So that's a good idea, and certainly something that people do on a day-to-day -day basis by making some assumptions and tuning, uh, tuning the cost functions. Any other thoughts? OK, how about this idea? I'm going to split this 0 to 100 in uh, basically three sets. So I have low inventory, I have medium inventory, and I have high inventory. So low inventory means I have between 0 to 20 t-shirts. Medium inventory means I have 20 to 70 t-shirts. High inventory means I have 70 to 100 t-shirts. Okay. So if I have high inventory, I'm not going to order anything. If I have medium inventory, I'm going to think a little bit about it. If I have low inventory, I'm definitely going to order 50 more t-shirts. Okay. So converting your 0 to 100 into low, medium, and high by lumping states together, that is known as state aggregation. So this one is state aggregation. This one is state aggregation. As you can see, you have aggregated the states. This one is state aggregation because you have lumped the states together. Uh, so these are all state aggregation system, uh, state aggregation approximation. So your original state space has a very large dimensional state space. But what you did was you projected that state space onto some subspace, or you aggregated the states in a certain fashion, and that is known as state aggregation. Okay. And again, the state aggregation will work differently for different systems. So it really depends on the specific system uh, that would drive how you want to aggregate the states inside the system. And the third, I mean, the third part was like uh, disaggregating the DP itself. So basically, you had three different states. So you just look at the DP corresponding to one state, and then DP corresponding to the second state, and DP corresponding to third state. So you are, what you are doing is you are disaggregating the entire dynamic programming equation uh, through some uh, uh, intuition, intuitive method. Uh, this is not something that people write in the books. So if you open a book, you won't really find it, because it's not really a theoretical, theoretically sound method. But which is not to say that this is not used in practice. This is actually used heavily in practice. OK? Disaggregating the DP. OK. The fourth part is uh, using certainty equivalence.
And even though I have not talked about stochastic control problem, uh, but let me give you a little bit of idea because this has come up in our discussions uh, just a few minutes a few minutes back. So in stochastic control problem, you have a noise wt term in your state transition function. So this wt term could be the weather, like the temperature outside. It could be the demand, like the t-shirt demand that we were talking about. Uh, this noise term could be uh, a solar radiation in case of uh, solar, uh, solar farms. It could be solar radiation. It could be cloud cover, which again is useful for solar radiation. It could be the wind velocity, which is useful for wind, wind farms and wind power plants. Um, it could be sea waves for some application, and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of noise all over, all, all around us. There is so much of noise uh, in terms of weather, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, extreme weather events, in terms of temperature, wind velocity, solar radiation, cloud cover, and so on and so forth. Uh, demand, demand for food, demand for clothes, demand for all sorts of things, hotel rooms, for instance. So you see, all of our systems are subjected to some exogenous noise. And when you have noise like that, solving this optimization problem becomes very difficult. Because now you have too many possibilities here, okay, in terms of noise. And in many cases, you don't quite know what's going to happen in the future. Right? All of you agree with that? Now let's ask you a simple question. We don't know what the temperature tomorrow at 12 noon is going to be. But do we know something about what the temperature at temperature tomorrow at 12 noon is going to be? Like, we don't know the exact number because that event hasn't happened yet. But is there a way by which we can acquire some information, some knowledge about it? What would you do if I ask you about the temperature tomorrow at 12 noon? What are you going to do about acquiring this information? Compared to today's, Compared to today's temperature. So today at 12 noon, it was, uh, I don't know, 40 Fahrenheit. So tomorrow at 12 noon, it's going to be 40 Fahrenheit plus minus epsilon. So that's one way to do it. Any other way? Yes. Right. Uh, look at the history. So he is going to look at the last 10 years of historical data or 15 years of historical data and can say with some confidence that this is what I'm expecting the temperature to be tomorrow. Anything else? You could just Google it. <laughs> you could just Google it and it will give you some forecast for tomorrow's temperature, not just at 12 noon, but for the entire time series from morning and all the way until evening. So naturally, you know, if, if it was 1950s, this is what you are going to do. Look at the last 10 years of data, look at what today's weather is and try to extrapolate that information. But in today's world, of course, you have very sophisticated time series uh, prediction models, uh, which are basically used for weather prediction. And so for tomorrow, you don't know what WT is going to be, but you do know a forecast of WT. And let's call that forecast the mean. Let me call it W bar T. So W bar T is the forecast for tomorrow's weather, or W bar T is forecast for tomorrow's solar radiation, or W bar T is forecast for tomorrow's demand. If it's going to be a hot weather, people are going to buy more ice cream. If it is going to be a cold weather, people are going to buy more coffee, right? So based on multiple things, you can come up with a forecast for what your demand is going to look like, W bar T. This is known as certainty equivalence. So you have an uncertain variable, and I'm going to replace that uncertain variable with a forecast of that uncertain variable and make it a certain variable. Okay, so this was unknown, but I have a forecast. And now I have some idea of what this variable is going to look like. Now I can solve this entire optimization problem based on that forecast. And this idea is 
certainty equivalence. For some of the things like weather, this W bar T is actually very well understood. In fact, I have found weather predictions to be remarkab remarkably uh, correct in, in my experience uh, from recent days. Uh, I'm actually surprised how, how cool this weather forecasting has become now. It's almost like very, very accurate. But there are some situations whether the forecast is really inaccurate. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you were a car manufacturer and you have to figure out how many cars your customers are going to buy over the next one year, okay, and then a pandemic happens or some economy takes a hit or something like that happens, and that number goes up or down significantly. So in those situations, this forecast is not really good, okay? So of course, in cases where forecast is really good, this algorithm will work very well. In cases where the forecast is really bad, which is the case in most of the supply chain problems, so you know, if you look at every industry, it has some input and it produces some output. And any of the factors in input or the demand can go off the rail, off the, off the charts or off what you expect it to be, and you would have a production problem, and you will just have to figure it out at that moment. So at this point of time, uh, many manufacturers are facing a shortage of uh, semiconductor chips, okay? And nobody could have predicted that, nobody could have forecasted that, right? Or pandemic, nobody could have forecasted that. And the fact that the tr demand for air travel went down to zero, almost instantaneously after the pandemic started. In fact, I remember that Southwest was flying for like $10 or $15 in April of 2020. I was so tempted to buy the tickets because I'd never seen prices so low. But, no, but the idea is that nobody could forecast some of those events. And so in some cases, the forecast would be really bad, in which case this is a very bad, uh, very bad approximate dynamic programming algorithm. And in some cases, this forecast could be really good, in which case certainty equivalence is a very good approximation for your dynamic programming algorithm. So another thing to uh, keep in mind. And the final thing that I want to talk about is uh, singular perturbation. Okay, any question in A to D? Because I'm going to erase both sides of the board to talk about singular perturbation. Okay, no questions? Okay, here is the problem. <coughs> you want to drive your vehicle uh, optimally, okay? You want to minimize the fuel consumption while going from uh, OSU to your home. That's your goal, that's your objective. So you want to minimize the fuel consumption subject to speed limit constraints, subject to traffic light constraints, and so on and so forth. You know, distance with the vehicle in front, uh, relative distance with uh, all sorts of different obstacles on the road. So you have some objective function, you have your own state dynamic function, and you want to optimize, you want to figure out what's the best way to drive your vehicle uh, is based on the dynamical equation of your vehicle and the fuel consumption model of your vehicle. That's your problem. Now, when you are driving the vehicle on, on the road, I don't know how many of you are drivers, but when you are driving the vehicle on the road, you look at the road and you try to predict what's going to happen in the next five seconds or what's going to happen in the next 10 seconds. And based on that prediction, you come up with your strategy of how you want to drive the vehicle. However, if you look at, if you go inside the vehicle's engine, the engine is actually running every 10 milliseconds. It's deciding what to do every 10 milliseconds or every five milliseconds. So, 
when you look at this five seconds of prediction window and based on that five seconds of stuff you want to decide what to do your engine is actually doing making 5000 decisions okay within that time window so the question is what exactly is happening in this particular problem because in a system you have one subsystem which has 5000 time steps but you have another subsystem which has only five time steps which is you as a subsystem you as a you as a controller you have uh, only five time steps but if you look at the engine it's actually running 5000 time steps so the question is how do you model this system and how do you come up with an approximate dynamic programming method <coughs> for that problem so here is the idea of singular perturbation <coughs> so your xt actually comprises of two states Okay, so your system has two states. One is your state as a driver and the second one is engine state. And your state as a driver is changing very slowly. So you are driving at 40 miles an hour and at the next second you will be driving at 41 miles an hour and at the next second you will be driving at 42 miles an hour. So the change is really small. On the other hand, if you look at the engine, the engine could be running at 2000 RPM now, it could suddenly jump to 3000 RPM at the next second and it could go down to 2000 RPM again and then it could go up to 2500 RPM at the next second. So this particular state is actually getting updated at a much faster time scale. So this is known as slow dynamics because yt plus 1 is almost equal to yt with some small term getting added and this is a fast dynamics <clears throat> so you have a slow dynamics and you have a fast dynamics And we have this optimization problem to be solved. So I'm going to write this, I'm going to ignore this uh, particular equality constraint. For the time being, but you can extend the analysis to this particular situation. And let's assume that there is an S, a mapping S, <coughs> from from x cross u to y no uh, from y cross u to z such that f2 of 
वाई एस वाई यू यू इक्वल्स टू एस वाई यू दिस इज माई अजम्पन So for a given y u pair, this is the equilibrium state for the fast dynamics. So if I'm pressing the accelerator at a specific angle, and if my velocity is 40 miles an hour, there is an equilibrium engine speed at which the engine speed is not going to change over time. Okay. So if I keep my if my if my velocity is 40 miles an hour and my accelerator is at a steady angle. then there is an engine rpm which is not going to change over time okay that's this assumption assumption is mostly satisfied in all the applications so you always have an equilibrium uh, state for the fast dynamics for a given uh, state for the slow dynamics and a given action that you are taking okay and we also expect gt of y s y u and u to be less than equal to 0 so whatever that equilibrium state is for the fast dynamics the constraints are met for that particular equilibrium state so this has to be satisfied and this has to be satisfied <coughs> any question so far okay now what i am going to do is I have the original. Remember, I have a dynamic programming equation for a very long time horizon that I need to solve. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split that problem into two dynamic programs. Okay, just like your original, like one of your original thoughts. So I'm going to split this optimization problem, this this dynamic program, into two separate dynamic program. One dynamic program which I'm going to call fast dynamics optimization. sorry uh, one is slow dynamics optimization and one is going to be well i'll i'll write the fast dynamics optimization a little later so in slow dynamics optimization i'm going to assume that the second state uh, zt is always going to be the equilibrium state for that particular y u pair and so the state transition function would be yt plus 1 equals to yt plus epsilon f1 and i want to minimize there is no ut plus 1 so okay i'll just keep it ut for the time being but i need to replace it with whatever the equilibrium state is going to be at that particular time and then plus summation ct of yt s y t u t u t t goes from 0 to capital t and the constraint is g t of y t s y t u t u t less than equal to 0 
and I'm going to minimize it. Mu t that maps y t to u t. What do you notice here in this optimization problem? <coughs> so in this optimization problem, the state is yt, the action is ut, and you have actually reduced the dimension of the state space uh, in, in the slow dynamics optimization. So it's a lower dimensional optimization problem, lower dimensional, in, lower dimensional in the sense of state. So the state has lower dimensional. And it's a constrained optimization problem, constrained uh, dynamic problem that can be solved easily because you have a much lower dimensional state space here. Okay? So you have eliminated one of the one of the state, I mean, it's not really one state, it could be like a bunch of states that are fast dynamic states. So you've eliminated a bunch of states from your, from your optimization problem, right? Okay. So you can solve this problem. Now what happens for the fast dynamics. So what you do is you come up with a fast a corresponding fast dynamics optimization problem. So let me write that down. So you come up with a fast dynamics so you define a new state z tilde t which is z t minus uh, s of y t comma u t And then you minimize uh, wait. So you have your F2 of yt. Oh, what is this ut? Ut is mu star t yt. So you, you get the solution from slow dynamics, you substitute that here, and you get the perturbation in the second. Uh, perturbation in the second state, uh, the fast dynamic state. So I have this original F2 of y, this was the state transition function for the ZT. So I instead substituted Z tilde T plus uh, the equilibrium state and U tilde T plus the 
uh, action coming out of the original slow dynamics optimization problem. And then I'm going to linearize using Taylor approx approximation. So I'm going to do the Taylor approximation with respect to this z tilde t and with respect to u tilde t. And I'm going to get a linear system in z tilde t, u tilde t. So z tilde t is the, the error in the equilibrium, error in the state for the fast dynamics and u tilde t is correction to the action coming out of slow dynamics optimization. Should that be uh, mu star of yt? Oh yeah, it should be yt, thank you. This should be yt here, please make the correction. Okay. So what we get is a <coughs> linear system in z tilde t, u tilde t, and then you come up with a tracking problem. <coughs> you want to minimize z tilde t transpose q z tilde t plus u tilde t transpose r u tilde t. I'm going to add t equals zero to capital T and that's it, uh, with maybe some, some constraints. You may want to add some constraints here so that this constraint will be met. So let me just write it as gt of yt st s of yt comma ut, no. mu star t yt plus u tilde t, no, plus z tilde t, and u t, u tilde t plus mu star yt less than equal to zero. So you can, you can add this term or you can just uh, ignore this term depending on whether the constraint is important or not. So if you ignore this term, if you ignore this constraint, it's a usual LQG problem, and you have already solved LQG problem, uh, sorry, LQR problem, you, you, you have solved LQR problem by hand, and solving this particular problem is actually fairly straightforward, okay? So solving this is fairly straightforward, but if you add a constraint, then it becomes a more complicated affair. So in most systems, people would ignore this constraint and they will just solve, you will have a linear system with quadratic cost. You can use the LQR theory to solve the problem and get the optimal policy. And then the act actual control on the system would be mu star t yt plus u tilde star t. That comes from here. This is your, well, I should actually write gamma star t of xt. <coughs> so the optimal, well, actually it should be approximately optimal policy. So this is an approximately optimal policy for your original problem. Again, if you look into the books, you won't find this algorithm, but it's heavily used in a lot of different applications. So there are, of course, books written on singular perturbation theory, but those are all in continuous time. So what I have done here in the, on the blackboard is converted the continuous time theory into a discrete time uh, formulation. Um, so this is uh, what is known as singular perturbation theory. And this kind of uh, approximate dynamic programming technique is very useful in hierarchical systems. So what do I mean by hierarchical system? 
So you have a top system, which is a slow dynamic system, where the state changes every few seconds. And then you have a fast dynamic system where the state changes every few milliseconds. And then you may have like further hierarchical uh, subsystems where the time scale would be much, much faster, like in microseconds or nanoseconds. So, so those are known as a singularly perturbed system. And this is the way to do the optimization for those systems. So if you think about it, a good example for this particular system is, uh, for instance, you have a solar panel and you have a battery and you have an inverter in between. And if you think about it, the inverter battery system has to make decisions every microseconds. Okay, so their decisions are, like if, if there is a cloud cover, if there, is, if there is solar panel and there's a cloud passing over the solar panel, the solar panel will see a decrease in production almost within microseconds. And the battery, sorry, the inverter has to identify that the generation from solar panel has decreased and so it will start pumping electricity from the battery pack into the house so that your loads are not, uh, your loads are still served at all times and it doesn't really stop. So for instance, if you have a television which you are running through solar power directly without the inverter and battery system, as soon as the cloud passes over, the television is going to shut down. Okay, and you don't like that. Or your refrigerator is going to shut down or your uh, microwave is going to shut down and all of that is going to create a problem. So what you do is you put a battery pack and you put an inverter so that as soon as the production from solar panel goes down, the battery will take over and will serve the load that you may be running in your house. And in this particular system, uh, you can do like a, uh, you will have multiple time scale optimization that you can do um, in order to optimize your total load over time. And this is the method to do the optimization for those systems because you have multiple, you have things that are running at multiple time scales. So this is another form of model approximation because now you have the original system with a very high dimensional state space and you disintegrated it into a smaller dimension optimization problem and another smaller dimension LQR problem. And LQR problems are very easy to solve. So this, you don't even feel it that you're solving this problem. You only have to worry about this particular problem. <clears throat> so that's all I have for the, uh, for the model approximation. Uh, we have studied all different techniques in approximate dynamic program. Now you can do a lot of mix and match so you can do any number of combinatorial mix and match, and you can come up with a new algorithm of your own for whatever application you are interested in. Um, and uh, that's it. The, the entire syllabus for the course is over. So we will not have class on Monday and Wednesday. Thank you for attending this class. And uh, please, uh, uh, please fill up your SEIS form. I think the currently only 4% or 5% of the class has filled up their SEI, so please do go back and fill your SEIs for this class, as well as for the EC5555 class. And, uh, and uh, thank you all for attending. It was a pleasure teaching you all, and uh, I hope you guys will use some of the stuff we discussed in your career ahead and make a lot of money. And pass on some of the money to me. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs>